This is a joint paper with uh, Sergio Rebello and with Arlene Wong. And I just got an email this morning that given that I moved from the US, I'm no longer allowed to be affiliated with the NBR. So I'm not longer affiliated there. Make America great again. OK, perfect. So I'm very happy that uh, Chari is here, because actually a lot of his comments made it to the paper after the last time he saw it. So hopefully, if you don't like this one, then you're contradicting yourself. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so this is what we're doing. Uh, just a big uh, overview. On, on the empirical uh, aspect, we're going to learn a new channel. And I'm going to show you some evidence that hopefully will convince you that during the Great Recession, there are two things that happen. And I'll be specific about this later, but just to give you a big overview. Consumers basically traded down in the sense of the quality of the goods they were consuming. They basically went down to lower quality goods. OK, so I will show you that. Uh, I think there is pretty strong evidence of that. The other thing is that actually I will show you that production in, in the US of lower quality goods, um, the lower the quality of the good is, the less labor per dollar sale it uses. That's the concept of labor intensity. Okay? That's pretty quite a surprising evidence, very robust. Okay? So lower quality goods uh, require less labor per dollar of sales. Okay? So together, just in this accounting sense, trading down, the fact that consumers went out to lower quality goods together with this fact, reduce basically labor demand and increase the severity of the recession. And we'll have some back of the envelope uh, numbers on that. Okay, so that would be the empirical part. On the theoretical part, this is going to be accounting. And accounting, as well, remember from undergrad, is really a terrible thing. So I want to get a sense of the, the mechanics, okay, of the model. Is this intuition that I'm going to try and provide you at the beginning? Can it survive uh, an equilibrium argument, both in partial equilibrium and general equilibrium? So I'm going to embed quality choice in several GE models, okay? And basically, going to be models with quality decisions that are going to be consistent with our empirical facts. Okay? And today, I'm going to apply to a cyclical shock. Okay? And I'm going to show you that the introduction, the merit introduction of this quality angle, together with this idea of labor intensity, is going to amplify quite significantly uh, the effects of shocks. And you're also going to do some interesting things about co-movement and a bunch of other uh, long-lasting puzzles in business cycle. Okay? Okay, so let me jump kind of to the main part. So usually when we think about, usually, when I think about, or when I used to think before this paper, about changes in uh, shares, allocation of consumption, uh, my natural inclination was to think about, well, there are some categories that are necessary, necessities, some categories that are luxuries, think about estimating angle curves, and the kind of example we always teach is about food, right? So food at home is a, uh, is a, um, is a necessity, food away from home is a luxury, and that's kind of where we think we see substitution. This is, in fact, when you look at the data, if I have some time, I will talk about this. This is where you see the biggest shift in shares during the recession. If you work at home, it's not a luxury. Yeah, work at home, it is a bit. I mean, if you work at Autonoma, it's not a luxury. It's not a luxury. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, I will pass it to the management. <laughs> OK, so this is what happens. So this is the, kind of the way you would look at categories. You say, well, here comes the recession. And then, indeed, we stop going out and we start cooking more at home. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the category. The paper is not about this. The paper is about the following thing. So you decide, you know, for whatever reason, financial reasons or whatever reason, that you don't want to go out anymore. It's a recession. But then Friday comes. And for those of you who have kids, you know that Friday, at the end of the weekend, you're really tired. And you really want to go out and say, let's just go out for one hour, whatever. Let's go eat something. Okay. So condition on deciding to go out, the paper is about what do you do when you go out. Okay, as long as it's legal stuff, okay? And they say, well, what happened to the allocation of food? The paper is not about food, this is just an example, okay? The what are the conditions of going out? What, what do you do? And what you see is that as the recession comes, this is just strictly from NIPA, you can get it. There is a fall, there is a fall in uh, the food service, which is basically restaurants uh, with um, waiters, etc. And there is a jump in the McDonald's, the fast food. OK. I want to show you that these patterns of allocation, of this increase in what you would think about as a lower quality versus high quality, are quite severe. OK, so now the thing about also about the, the labor intensity angle. You go to a nice restaurant. There are a lot of people floating around you. There is a sommelier. There is this. There is the whole. There are a lot of people. You go to McDonald's. If there is somebody who speaks English, that's quite lucky. OK. Okay, that's kind of what I want you to think. You go to, you go to buy groceries. If you go to Whole Foods, the guy who greets you has a PhD in English. Okay? You go to a dollar store, you know, 
It's a different experience. Okay. Okay. So this, this leads to the following slide. I'm going to refer to quality as basically anything, because I'm going to look at prices at the end of the day. Okay? So I'm going to refer to quality as anything that consumers are willing to pay for. So in the grocery example, maybe you enjoy going to Whole Foods and there is somebody you can talk to about Shakespeare. Maybe sometimes you, you value and that's why you're willing to buy, to, to pay more. Maybe also the actual meat that you are getting uh, is uh, organically beef, uh, da, 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 da. And in, in fact, it reflects a true better meat. Okay, so I'm going to lump all of those. I cannot distinguish between those. Okay, okay, and I'm going to use then basically uh, for most of the talk uh, prices that I observe or, or proxies for prices as my measure of quality. And okay. so this is the empirical approach I'm going to to have at the beginning on on the data, and then I'm going to implement something very similar in the model. Okay. So I'm interested in understanding this, aggregate employment, okay? I want to understand how much of the change in the Great Recession of this uh, came from trading down, came from the going to McDonald's instead of going to Maxim, okay? So I want you to think that my data is coming in a bunch of uh, sectors, let's call them M. And for each sector, I'm going to observe the sectoral employment, NMT, okay? I can just rewrite the, the sectoral employment is basically a weighted average of, so think about the food away from home. There is the low quality tier, the McDonald's, there is the medium, I don't know what would be a medium, but uh, California Pizza Kitchen, okay? And they're going to be the high one. So I'm going to each, each, uh, each sector, I'm going to have three quality tiers, you're going to see later how do I do that. And then for each quality, I'm going to use data to get their share of revenue. So for all the food away from home, what is the share of each of these three quality tiers? And then for each whoa, of these quality tiers, I'm going to have also data on what's the measure of this labor intensity that they use. So the food, uh, fa uh, the, food fast, uh, the fast food industry in the, in the US, how many workers do they use per dollar of sales? Okay, so that's just an accounting identity. And then once I have it for each uh, sector, I can aggregate up by the share of each sector in the economy, and I'm going to get the total employment in the US. Are you going to use the number of workers in the US or the payments the, the number of workers or the payments? Or payments. Okay, so as you can see here, actually it tells you you want to use the number of workers. I could rewrite it, obviously, in terms of uh, shares. It is going to be guided by the fact that we're going to use CompuStat data. Okay, and CompuStat does not report for the majority of firms does not have information on wages. Only for a quarter of firms there is information on wages. So because of data issues, we're going to do it as employment. I can tell you for the subsample, it's the same. The subsample, the 25% that actually report wages, you could redo everything, you get the same result. Okay. Okay. Cool. So now I have this. I have a measure of aggregate employment that has uh, sectorial shares, quality within the sector shares, and the labor intensity. And now I can ask the following thing. So this is employment, let's say, in 07, before the recession. This is employment at some point at the end of the recession. Okay. Now I'm going to create a counterfactual. Where I'm going to say, look, let what this is doing, this terrible thing, is saying, I'm going to allow the, the size of the pie to change, as it did in the data. This is what this is doing, aggregate sales, the size of the pie. What I'm going to now ask in the counterfactual is this. What would have happened if the composition within the pie, the shrink, and I'm going to like to shrink, what if the composition had remained the same? What if the share of the McDonald's versus the nice restaurant has not, had not changed? Had it remained as in 07? Okay, so I'm going to do a counterfactual. Well, only thing I'm changing is this, the quality share. Okay, so that's kind of the, the idea. Okay, cool, so let me, let me jump. So I need basically two things as we were just uh, discussing. I need per each firm a measure of quality, and uh, we can have long debates, and I'm sure we are going to have about what is quality, but I'll show you how we do it. I need a measure of labor intensity. Okay, so for labor intensity, <laughs> here's the first caveat of the paper, that we have to rely on CompuStat, so it's publicly traded companies. There might be a selection there. There is not much I can, I can do about, about that. Okay, we have now a, a subsequent paper where we're using uh, census data to look at the, today it's CompuStat, okay? So I have measures from CompuStat from the 10K uh, on uh, the labor per sales of a firm, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to merge it with a bunch of different uh, data set that will allow me hopefully to categorize the quality of this firm. So each firm, McDonald's, I see labor per uh, dollar, okay? And I'm going to basically merge it with Yelp, okay? Uh, I'm going to merge it with, and I'll explain to you in a second how I do that. I'm going to merge it with sense of retail trade, and then I'm going to use the PPI to look at manufacturing firms, and I'm going to consider a bunch of the, the other data sets. 
As I go through the talk, you are going to have a lot of caveats in your mind. I'm not going to discuss them. But there are going to be alternative definition of labor intensity, different time period, excluding franchise companies, which is actually a big issue for this fast food, uh, indirect effects from IO matrices. We did all of that. The main point, well, quantitatively, might, the main point qualitatively is there. OK, so let me, let me go uh, with this approach. OK, so this is the fun part, OK? So for each firm in a uh, bunch of sectors uh, we have in Yelp, basically we scrape data from Yelp, OK? And we categorize for each store location in the US. Um, we have uh, the dollar associated with the firm, OK? So it's going to be the low, the middle, and uh, actually Yelp has four categories, but there's not many that have four, uh, four dollars, so we're going to merge them together. Okay, and when you look at that, it's kind of what your prior is. McDonald's will be here, and you know. This is, for example, actually where a public trade company in restaurant is a good example. A lot of them are some boutique bistros that are not going to be listed, all right? So that's where you might be thinking that there, there is an issue. But, so this would be relatively usually more the, the big kind of uh, restaurant companies that hold a lot of uh, nice bar grills in Santa Monica, etc. Okay. okay. The customers. The this is a review. Because I know every time I, go, I come to Europe, people tell me, what is Yelp? I'm sorry. Okay. So, so Yelp is an online platform where customers review basically everything. There is, might be a Yelp for this conference. I'm sure it's going to be four stars. Okay. But... Um, no, no, no. No, no. no. <laughs> yeah, right. It's going to be... It's this is the price. Actually, the, 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 <laughs> they are correlated. We can talk about that. But basically, it's, you go to a restaurant, and then after that, you give it a restaurant. Restaurant, actually, you see the prices of the menu. So Yelp takes the menu prices and translates it. For other things, is what you value it. Okay? Okay. Okay. So then for each firm in my data, I'm going to merge it with, uh, with CompuStat. And I'm going to have for each number this the pair. Okay? Okay, cool. <laughs> I don't have to do it with the census of retail trade. They're actually, uh, yes, Anki, sorry. In, in, in the CompuStat, are there firms which, are you worried that firms might straddle multiple categories because they have multiple product lines? OK, so that's called the Gap problem. Because Gap has five types of companies. Right. They have yeah, yeah. Old Navy, Gap, Banana Republic, Athleta, and something that my wife likes to buy from shoes, OK? And you might think that Banana Republic is a different beast from, from, um, from a gap. That's actually a problem. Quantitatively, it's a gap problem. <laughs> but besides that, um, this is number of price ranges spanned by each firm. So you can see that about uh, more than 50% actually are just in one. Okay? And if you look just at it and say, look, I'm going to look at two, and they're always adjacent, it's, you're covering everything. Um, so practical. But that was an issue, but you know, I think de facto, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. And then the census, the census uh, divides the data into three categories by themselves. Actually, they're saying this is going to be the non discount store, so uh, Nordstrom. This is going to be the discount department stores, the middle quality, and uh, I know, calls. And this will be the local. Well, actually, I like calls. So, and this will be the Sam's Club. Okay, and then for this again we go to CompuStat and you can, okay, cool. So let me show you a bunch of things. So I have five categories. We construct the weighted average for each of these categories of the labor intensity. Okay, so let me show you first that this is the weighted average overall in the economy. You see this pattern that as you move up in the quality tier, the labor intensity increases, okay? And what you can see is also that within each category besides this one, okay, uh, there is this, uh, the same pattern. As you're moving up the quality tier, moving up the quality tier, increasing, increasing, increasing. Okay, so the strong fact that, again, with different ways to do it, you're going to get this idea of labor intensity increasing uh, with quality. There is a secondary effect that, again, we cannot do with computer, but we have this other side that, if you go back to the Whole Food example I told you, I told you, not only they have more workers, they also have PhD in English. The type of skill is different. That's something you cannot do from CompuStat. This other co the, from this other data set that now we have finally access to, where you can actually look at the composition. And as your prior might be, higher quality goods use also not only more labor, more skilled workers. Okay, so that, there is a companion paper that talks about that. Okay, but today it's just going to be about the number. Okay, so we have this pattern. So for fact one, production of higher quality is quite almost all of these uh, sectors, more labor intensive. Okay, this was in 07. 
The share of low quality in these sectors was 35%, the middle was 58, and the high was 7. What happens in 2012? And we're going to look at uh, 2012 because that's kind of where income per capita starts to reverse in the US. Okay, so let's, let's go to those five years. In those five years, what I want you to see is this. Basically, the, the patterns here are, are, are sustained, okay? So you have the, you're going to have the same increases here. But this is the key thing. So the low quality share increases by 7% from 35 to 42. And it's almost, almost all one-to-one -one with the middle declining. Okay? This relates, if you, if you read the New York Times. Yes. the New York Times about the disappearance of the middle class, a lot of what David Otto, this is kind of the consumption uh, counterpart of that. Middle class usually buys middle quality. It's kind of, we have this other household data that we, should, we see that uh, with mint data. And so it's not surprising that that's where you see kind of, of, the, of the adjustment. Okay. Okay, cool. So we have this, uh, and you can see that again, this is just to show you um, uh, this adjustment by sectors, and you see that the low is gaining everywhere. And it's almost always one to one, you know, subject to some. Uh, outliers coming from the mid from the middle. Okay, perfect. So now I can implement that. Uh, yes, thank you. So how do you deal with online sales here? Because I'm worried that what people are just doing is not substituting away from high quality goods, just shopping more aggressively online for high quality goods. I used to go to Nordstrom to buy my shoes. Mm -hmm. Now because money is tight, I'm buying the same shoes. I'm just you know shopping online for it. That's fine, but then the market shares are still changing, right? I mean, the market shares are it's going to be reported in CompuStat as a sale. No, but that's a, I mean, it, the market share for the manufacturer may not be. You see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm trying to distinguish between, you know, yeah. some, the retail, some of the, some of the stuff. I, I see the retail kind of thing very clearly when you do the classification of stores. But it's not so clear what happens to them. So, so let's just take an example. Let's assume that online only exists for the high uh, scale. Let, let me see if I'm following your argument. And let's say that the only change was no one goes to the stores anymore, the brick and mortar, and they just shop online. And let's say that online is half the price. Right. OK. So what I'm going to capture is a, a fall in the share of the high quality. Right? Now, in that, in that, in that example. I'm telling you there is a technology thing here in the sense that I say, for a dollar, sure, sure, sure. you use less, more workers as you're shifting so, the dollars away. So you're saying in my, the, the example I gave, you're looking at this at the level of the manufacturer, not at the level of the retailer. This is the level of the retailer. No, no, the level of the retailer. So all I'm saying is that if the shares, so let's assume we had uh, 45, 45, 10, just to make sure. you an example. And now the only change is that you are, you didn't change your, uh, you're still buying um, Nordstrom, but online. And online is half the price. Let's assume that nothing else changed. No, no, but I'm not wait, buying wait. from Nordstrom. I'm buying from Amazon. No, you're still buying Shoe X, but Nordstrom sells Shoe X and Amazon sells Shoe, shoe, shoe X. Okay. Right? I'm, I'm, okay. Yeah, that's what Amazon, you're Okay, perfect. Okay. So in that sense, let's say, Give me something that I can put in the quality bin. Amazon will not be in the quality right, bin. Yeah. But let's assume that you went to, you went to something that is in a yeah. quality bin. Then I understand. Then, then that's it, right? Then it's fine. Right. So you might be worried. OK, so one thing might be worried that maybe a lot of them got, went out, especially from the middle and the high, into something I'm not capturing. Right. And OK. OK. So now I can implement my empirical approach, the one I started with. And I said that overall, in these sectors, uh, during this period, employment falls by 3.5%. And if I do my counterfactual, you get this what looks almost too good to be true number. You do just the adjustment. It tells you absent trading down, OK? Employment would have fallen only by 4%, uh, by 0.4%. OK, so 88% of this changes in the, the shares. I mean, that sounds a bit too big. The numbers are the numbers. You know, as long as we match everything correct, the numbers are the numbers. OK. So if you're just interested in say, look, in that period of time, between 07 and 12, how much of the fall in these sectors, I want to emphasize, this is the sector that covers maybe about a third of the economy, OK? Uh, how much is coming from this trade down? It's about 88%. Now you can say, well, OK, in here. But this might be mixing two things, maybe a cycle, maybe as a trend, as we're talking about the New York Times. It's not obvious with one time period how to do it. The, the best we could do it let's say, with this data is we, we went back. We took a trend before uh, the recession. So you can say there is indeed already, you see changes in share that occur before. Uh, the easiest one for presentations to do a linear trend, it doesn't really matter as much what, what you do. And then it tells you that about half, half, um, about half of the, 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 of the change comes from cyclical trading down. Again, I, I'm not going to put my, I'm not going to commit to exactly what is cycle versus trend here. The overall effect is big and in this condition, on this, 
a trend adjustment, um, you get about half. Okay, so looks pretty big. Let me take here just pause. You remember I started with food away from home and food out of home. You could do all of this at the sectoral level, okay? Build labor intensity by sec. You get nothing. It's quite surprising actually. Again, my priority was oh, the sector is what's going to. You get quantitatively, and, and you know we won't have time. I, I can explain to you because the correlation between sectoral necessities and labor intensity is not as clear as the quality. So actually, this is the important channel. Okay, I see I'm running. Oh, so okay. You can do a, this is one of the slides that you take six months in the basement in Washington to do, and then you're going to skip them, okay? But you can construct for every firm. If we were interested, part Venki, part of your, is it just, just a retailer thing. So there are, uh, what we did is we merged CompuStat now with the PPI, that's a producing price. We use, again, prices uh, as an indicator of quality. I, I'm going to skip a bunch of details. You end up with three sectors. What, you, again, you take away is, Again, this is manufacturing. This is, I can understand the retailer. That I understand. I, my period experience, I haven't been enough time in production units. The fact that this also exists in, in production, to me, looks, uh, I mean, qu quite surprising, but maybe it shouldn't. But labor intensity increases with quality. Okay, again here. And again, market shares. This is 07 to 2012. So it increased about 5%, again, almost one to one with the middle. Okay, so something that ex ante, my prior was, it was not going to be there. Again, lower quality produces again market share. Okay, you can do again the same example. In these sectors, employment falls by 8.6%. Counterfactual would have fallen only by 3.9. This uh, quality trade round accounts for about half. I cannot do a trend adjustment because of data issues. You cannot go with the PPI before 07 to do this, unfortunately. So <laughs> we don't know. Okay. Yes, please. Do you take the price before the crisis as a quality index or are you adjusting during the crisis? Because maybe labor-intensive firms are more able to cut the price in the crisis. So, so here I'm, I'm just implementing. Just of, um, I'm just implementing my approach here. Okay, I'm just. This is where the, the equation tells me what I should be putting. I should be putting uh, the shares in T plus one. I should put the labor intensity T plus one. For uh, 07, I should put the LIT. Where to put them in what category bin? Whether you do it in 07, that doesn't matter. They don't change. They don't change. Okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, let, let me skip. This, this is just one where you... Let me skip this one. Okay. Um, so, uh, today we kind of... I, I spoke rather briefly on these two major data sets, the Yelp and PPI. The key takeaway, and this holds in a bunch of other data sets, that higher priced store producers are more labor intensive and they lost market share during the recent recessions and different uh, data sets are always coming with something that is about 50% more or less. Okay? Okay. And again, I'm going to apply today for business cycle, but you can think about other shocks which we're doing in companion papers, among long trend shocks, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, cool. So what do I want to do with the model? So I want to think about, uh, just to get a, a sense, what are the things that we thought that a model should have to think? We need a model where obviously there's going to be something about quality, kind of. Redundant otherwise. I want a model that will deliver this uh, key fact, which is labor intensity increasing with quality. Okay, this is what we found before in the data. I want something that is the maintained process in the empirical approach that prices increase with quality. Okay. I want a model where quality is a normal good, because that's kind of the logic I, I was putting on. I say, well, times are bad, people downgrade. So I want that something that will deliver this as a result. And I want obviously I'm talking about labor, so I want something that determines labor. Let me start weirdly. I always start with preferences, but I'm going to consider actually a bunch of different uh, utility framework. So let me start with the production because the production is always going to be the same. Okay. So you could get very creative if you want to think about facts two and three, but we wanted to stay close to existing fr uh, production framework. So I would. There's only one type of labor. No, no, perfect. Per quality, per. Per a given level of quality, let me con d discuss this. And then we're going to discuss a model, you see there, heterogeneous, it's going to be a model with many qualities. Okay, but given now, given, think about this as a pro the problem of McDonald's. But where is labor? Is it age? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. So think about this as the consumption good sector per given quality, the McDonald's problem, okay? So they produce with the CES. Okay, it's going to be perfectly competitive to make life simple, a constant markup, let me, let me know again into markups. Okay. Uh, they're going to use labor 
in pr pr to, to produce the McDonald's services. They are going to hire capital to produce the McDonald's uh, services. Okay? And Q is going to be the given quality of, of the McDonald's. And what you can see, you're going to see in, in a second, this is basically say, per given output that you want and capital that you want, the higher Q, the more labor you need. It's like a, it's a quasi negative TFP in a way to think about it, or negative labor augmenting, that's a way to think about it. Okay, so just think about this, and then what this gives you, as long as rho is negative, okay, and remember the elastic substitution between labor and capital is one over one minus rho, okay? So given the production, uh, the, the maximization problem of, of, of this firm, if rho is negative, you get the three facts that we're interested in. You get prices increasing with quality, you get labor intensity increasing in quality, and something that is more traditional um, is the labor to capital ratio is increasing with quality. Okay, so uh, looks like, you know, you have to put it here. A lot is going to be determining what this Q is in equilibrium, but given a Q, that's kind of the problem. Okay, uh, and I'm going to think about an investment. It's going to be a general equilibrium model with investment and capital. So I'm going to have an investment. Now, I'm going to think about all the channels I've been talking about as on consumption. So I'm not going to think about investment having any quality channels. So it would be identical. Okay, I'm just going to have, uh, so it's going to be in, uh, in, um, hours worked used in the investment sector, capital used in the investment sector, but no quality. Okay, so think about this, first year, two sector uh, model, if it's one quality, that you need to allocate things with this extra twist. Okay, that's I think the way to think about it. Okay, so let's look at the consumer problem. So you're assuming quality one for the investment sector? Yeah, that would be one way. There's no quality. Yeah, 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 fair. But that's a no it's important because it will depend on how you calibrate. Yeah, but that's a normalization. That's a normalization. I'm happy to go with the first order conditions. Okay. No, no, but <laughs> your intuition that this is something important, you're right. But okay. Okay. So I'm, I, we consider basically on the consumer side three and a half models. Okay. Why a half? <laughs> so first, there is a proof in the paper on the consumer side for this general class of models, you need some type of non homotopicity. Okay? So one, you know, I think for the, most of us, when you think about non-homotopicity, you think, oh, stone geary. Okay, so that would be, in this model, there would be, there are two qualities, the McDonald's and the uh, nice restaurant. They're given, <coughs> set to calibrate some, some, math, some data facts. And what I'm going to do choose is what are the shares. And as long as you have stone geary, then as the income goes up, you move into the high quality. So that would be one model, okay. The other model is going to be a model where actually you choose what is the quality level and how much you want to consume of it, okay? And back to Albert uh, question. So this will be a model, that's in this example of two goods, you can introduce more. This is going to be just for the sake of argument, the first model is going to be a model where you choose just one quality level, okay? okay. And then this is the half model I consider. I say, well, but how do I map a one good model to the data? It's going to be, uh, an extension of this one good model into a heterogeneous agent module where there's basically the entire menu of qualities being chosen. Okay? And then for those of you who like to do sticky prices, there is an appendix about sticky prices with quality. Okay? This is important, yes, not because I think, you know, because it actually shows that it's not exactly what, it doesn't matter what is the shock. You could produce here an, a real shock, here a nominal shock, you get the same, the same fact. Okay, so I'm running out of time, I think. One of them, what you want to match, you want to match some type of market shares labor intensity. That's always the, the, the logic of the calibration. Okay, so let me just show you the two, con let me, you understand how the stone Geary model works. That's something you have all seen. So let me spend most of the time on the, what I call the QC model. Okay, the quantity consumption. So I'm going to think about here, first year PhD with this. So separable preferences, okay, but you have this. Okay, so this is, ne this is necessary to have, in order to have, you, you, did, you did the, the non-homothetivity, okay, so this you get right away in the stone geary, as long as this is uh, positive. Um, you need this to get the non-homothetivity in this one good model, okay? Okay, so why, why, personally, why do I like this? Because this really makes everything very transparent. This is the usual model we have been all working with, you know, all our lives, and you just say, I'm going to introduce this. Okay, so once you have this, the consumer is going to choose consumption. This is the one good, I'll show you how the, to do the heterogeneous agents later. You choose how many cars, how many bananas. Do you want fair trade bananas, organic bananas, okay? And then you choose how much to work, how much to invest, and how much capital uh, 
to, accum to accumulate. And there's also going to be the allocation problem between the consumption sector that produces the bananas and the investment sector. That's the two-sector version. OK, cool. So equilibrium, nothing uh, special, given price function, uh, which is kind of the interesting thing is that the price of equality, there is a schedule there. And the state variables, which are capital and uh, technology, or TFP, household optimizers choosing uh, consumption quality, supply of hours and investment, investment goods firms optimize, consumption goods optimize, markets clear, and the law of motion. Okay, so nothing, nothing special. The only new thing relative is the price of quality that is floating around. But the labor is the same for all quality This is right now a one quality good, just to make it simple. So I'm, right now I'm thinking there is one quality at each point in time. Okay, let, let me start with that and then I'll do the, I'm happy to jump to the multiple qualities if you want. But no, let, no, okay, no. okay. Right now it's one quality. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so this is more to, to, to get the machinery. Okay, okay, so. What I'm going to show you in a little few slides that this model generates a lot of amplification in the labor market. Okay, a lot of the puzzles that we teach in the first year are bloop, disappearing here. Okay, so let me break it into labor demand channel and labor supply channel. Okay, so let me think about the source of amplification of the labor demand. So there are two propositions in the paper that say, think about the partial equilibrium model for a second, just to get the, the, the machinery going. So let's think about the model that there is no labor supply, no investment. So the only thing I'm going to think about is how to allocate in this QC model, how do I allocate? Uh, Can this again, what, which was the QC? Yeah, 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 you're right, as I was saying. The Q, well, this is the model. for quality choice? Quality choice, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. thanks, uh, Charlie. Okay, so in this model, the, the, the decision is then, given this partial equilibrium, is uh, how, how many bananas and of what quality to buy. So income is exogenous, like truly partial equilibrium. It's like an I.O. paper, okay? but not deep like I.O. papers. Okay, so, so the first proposition paper say, take, because there is no I.O. people here, then I'm not sucking out to anyone. Four, for given levels of W and R, take the partial equilibrium, okay? In the model, where firms choose quality, okay, the response of ours, let's say to a negative income shock, is always higher than in a model where there is no quality choice. Okay, so it's a lot of algebra. Okay. In the stone Geary model where you decide given qualities how to allocate, again, for given levels of W and R, okay, the reaction of ours work to a exogenous falling income is always higher as long as there are no nomothetic preferences, that fee, okay? And you have quality difference and the labor intensity. Okay, so there are two proofs of that. Okay, so what is the, I, I think this is useful, not because I think, you know, I, I think the partial equilibrium really allows you, say, there's nothing about labor supply here. This is all about labor demand. And you can see it here really from here. So this is the optimal demand of factor of production for, for uh, hours worked and capital. This is what you usually get in the model, okay? So, I'm thinking about the world that R and W are constant now, but the income, as it's changing, it's affecting this choice. And because this is a pro-cyclical, you know, in, the, in, the, in this QC model, the Q is a normal good, so as you get richer, you want more of it, and the stone Geary model, we know that the share of the, the, share of the high Q good is pro-cyclical. As you get more income, you want K, Q. And the basically it's increasing relative to H to K, the, the labor to capital ratio, okay? So that's kind of the departure claim. This is kind of labor demand channel. Now you say, well, partial equilibrium near you were trending Northwestern. What is this, blah, blah, blah. So let me just uh, go into kind of trying to capture this in the general equilibrium model. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to talk anymore about the strong theory model. I think this, mo this model does better on some empirical aspect. I think it's a more interesting one. Okay, so uh, let me skip this. Okay, so this is the first order, this is the set of the uh, first order condition for a consumer problem. You have a decision for consumption, for quality, and what is nice is that the, the first order condition for hours, okay, is the same structure you, you always used. The thing is that lambda is a different beast now, okay? But I want you to think that per given lambda, if I was somehow magically able to hold lambda, this will tell you that it's all about how the wage moves. Okay, think about it. I know that Charlie doesn't like GHH, and I don't have GHH, but in a GHH world, that's what you would be having, okay? Okay, so there is a way to do it in general equilibrium. It's weird, but it, it does the, the trick. You can introduce 
uh, chi, this uh, distributive parameter, to be stochastic such that miraculously, this is, this is a pedagogical trick, it exactly cancels the fluctuations in lambda. It's weird, it's a weird, okay, fine, whatever, but it delivers the message. So I'm going to hold this basically not, not moving around. And then any move that I'm going to get in general equilibrium, this is now the general equilibrium model, any move I'm going to get is coming from the W. When, and the crucial thing is that this is the same equation for both models, the two sector RBC and this one. Okay, shut down this lambda and now compare the full volatility of in the volatility of hours in the model with quantity choice is almost double. So that's it. That, that stuff is doing a lot of stuff that Q move floating around. Okay? Okay. Now you could ask, okay, so that's kind of the labor demand. There's a partial equilibrium and this getting you, you can see that shutting down this stuff is doing, already doing a lot through this equation, basically. The, this equation. Okay. Okay, but there is also labor supply. Never to forget labor supply. Okay? And in the real world, in the real model, lambda is moving around. So how much is that doing here? Okay, so just, you know, this is redundant, but think about an economy where there's a fall in, ra in the real wage. Before you get that, so yeah. the reason why, so then wages must be moving a lot too, right? The what? Wages must be moving a lot too. Yeah. So then how does that compare to the data? Wages in the full model? In the model where you shut down lambda. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, this is, yeah. So Maybe. Be, is it realistic or? No, 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 but, but this is not the quote unquote correct model because lambda is moving in the true model. So this is just, as I said, this is a pedagogical way to show that even in the GE, uh, when I'm shutting down the lambda, the labor demand is doing that. Nah, yeah. Actually, in the model I'm going to show you, no, let, okay. Okay, cool. So now think about labor supply because lambda is moving. The Lagrange multiplier. Okay, so think about the fall in real wage. There is the usual substitution effect that we push down H as lambda as uh, W falls. And there's going to be the income effect via lambda is going to push up H. So what we know is that the weaker lambda is, the weaker this channel, the more action you're going to get actually on labor, right? Because this always counteracts. Okay, so here is one way to see it. Go back again to the model we just discussed, just to get a sense of what lambda is doing. In the, this two sector no quality model, if you shut down lambda, Boom, the volatility of hours worked, because this is why GHH is so successful. So the, the volatility of hours worked increases by a factor of seven in the model without quality if you shut down lambda as I did before. If you do it in this model, it does increase, but only by a factor of two. So you can see that the lambda is doing a lot, okay? So this is basically a statement that if you look at the full G model, the lambda is about a quarter less volta in the model with quality, okay? So you have these two things that are happening. And unfortunately, there is no, we spend a lot of time trying to do a fully orthogonalization. You cannot do it. This is kind of more of getting a sense that both channels are operating. You have the labor demand is switching because of this Q. And then basically um, the, um, the labor supply, the, the, the income effect is weaker. So it's not pushing back as much as in the, the basic model. It does push back a bit, but not as much. That's why you're getting the full action. So those two channels are there. Okay, and, and what's the intuition of why lambda is moving less in the model with quality? Because now you're giving agents two margins. In the basic model, it's like, I have no money, I have no bananas, boom, lambda is going up. Now it's like, I have no money. Well, I consume this banana, so maybe I will go for one day for non-organic. Okay, so you're just giving agents a bit more margin so they can smooth the lambda. Is there interesting, actually, asset prices and implication here? Um, but okay, because lambda would be the pricing character. Now. Okay, cool. Uh, let me skip this. Okay, so now let me just show you the numbers, okay? Um, Yes. There's no market failure No, everything is perfect. Uh, will, perfect. Will, will it be the case in the cardiovascular model as well? Or yeah. Okay. But that's because of the specific structure we, we chose. I'm, I'm not claiming it as a generality. Okay. We're going to take the usual parameters. There are a bunch of parameters that are different. Uh, let me skip the calibration. That's uh, too much a bunch of moments from the micro data. Okay, there is a fixed point. Let, let's forget about them for a second. Okay, okay, cool. So let me show you kind of the impulse response function in this QC model versus the, the benchmark. Model. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, this is what happens to hours worked in the, in the Q model. Uh, in the Q model. For the same shock, this is output, and this is in the model without quality choice. So you get two things here. You get the big, for the same shock, you get the big amplification. Okay, so this is the movement. And you see that these guys are moving much closer. That's the relative volatility. 
Okay, and this is what happens to quality. So there is this is in response to a negative shock. Okay, quality kind of the consumer straight down, etc. Okay, so let me show you what are the kind of moments to remember. So this is data, the relative quality to the GDP, the correction, the usual thing. This is the model no quality, a two-sector model. This is what happens in this model. So usually what we think, oh, we really want to get hours work to be as volatile as output. And we always know well, it's really hard to get. Actually, this model delivers even more than that. Okay, so this model gives you a huge volatility of hours relative to, to output. Okay, so just to comparison, shut down the quality channel. This is what you would get in, in, the, in the normal model. Okay, so you get a lot of volatility of hours. Check mark. The other thing, this is a two-sector model. So in two-sector model, it's kind of, you have to check what happens to, to co-movement. Okay? We know from Cristiano Fitzgerald, at least, you know, 20 years, about co-movement is still a puzzle, right? Hours in C, hours in I move together in the data. In the benchmark model, that's a usual failure. Actually, this model delivers that. Okay? Okay. Okay, so... Why is this, so the volatility we kind of discussed, there are two channels that are going to am amplify. Why is the co-movement working here? It's because in the usual, in this model, as you get richer, you want to consume more. Okay? But in the, in the basic benchmark uh, RBC model, you cannot do that. Okay? So you, you have to allocate hours and then they must move negatively. In this model, as you want to consume more, what are you doing? You say, well, I want to consume more, but I also want higher quality. And that's putting this extra pressure, again, the same channel that is then extra pressure on hours worked um, in the consumption sector, and that kind of can mitigate the, the, the effects on, on the co-movement puzzle. Okay, so, uh, I'm sorry, you know, that was kind of to get you a sense, with, with, with half a minute. This is weird because I was talking a lot about heterogeneity, different uh, quality tiers, so I'm going to take the model I just discussed, do an heterogeneous uh, agent version in the sense that people are going to have different skills, and then they're going to have different incomes, and then they're going to decide different quality. So it's exactly what I just discussed now, but just with people who have different incomes. Okay? And this is useful because basically I can, I can look at a model where there are multiple quality levels, and I think it facilitates the comparison of the model and empirical things. Okay? One thing, the, the quantitative results are basically the same as the representative agent. So the key message on, the, on these things I just discussed is the same. Okay, so that, that's a good uh, thing. Uh, we, we, with the risk of, um, I'm not presenting you the, the, the structure of this, but think about it, it's exactly what I just dis uh, discussed before, but now there is different people, different income. Okay, so Nobu is really rich, he's choosing different quality than and I do. Okay, that's kind of think about that way. Then you do all of this, uh, blah, 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 blah. Can you go back? Yes. That. So there's a key assumption built into each guy's choice problem, yes. which is an indivisibility. Right? You get to choose some particular level of quality and Correct. how much you consume. In the strong theory, no. Not in the strong yeah, in this theory, one. Yeah, yeah. But in this one. Yes, yes, do. yes. Is there any way of trying to extend it? So oh, yeah, yeah. That I can think of a menu. each household yeah. choosing a whole menu of yeah. different things. You could, really you could marry both models if you. If, uh, um, no, I, I want to maintain the balanced growth property. Yeah. So that's that sort of. Uh, who knows, that may not be important. So I can tell you that uh, qualitatively, I haven't done the numerical part, but you could do this with like a Dixit Stiglitz in qualities, uh -huh. regression, and yeah. the thing go through. Uh, I don't know the quantitative properties of that model. I know that pencil and paper you can work. Yes. So, uh, also, the interpretation is a little bit more complicated, right? In a world with heterogeneous agents, yes. it could be that quality is not, has an income elasticity of one. Sure. What you, all you're seeing is compositional shifts about our income. Maybe the rich take a hit. And because the rich take a hit and rich consume uh, lower quality goods, they're... But, so, but, but that's be a result of the model, to a shock. So let me show you what this model delivers in, in terms of steady state. Just, so this is, this is how rich you are. This is the quantity. This is how many bananas you, dry, you, you eat. This is the type of the bananas you eat. That's equilibrium. Okay. This is going to be then the price. These rich guys consume high-priced bananas. And this is the labor intensity implied. So now, this is just what the model delivers. Now I can subject it to a shock. Okay, mm -hmm. and I know I'm running 10, 10 seconds. W one thing that is interesting, in this model I can do exactly the same empirical approach I did before. Exactly. Now I have well-defined uh, shares and everything. You could do this. Uh, you can say, well, let me shock the economy such that I get exactly the same changes in the, in the low share of the, uh, in the data, the 7%. Implement now, this is the DGP, implement the, 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 uh, the same approach. In the data, to remind you, it was about half. We were getting that it was trading down. In the model, the fall, is about 4.8%. Absent trading down, you get fall of 1.9.
So actually, the model you do same project will get about 60%. So it's not the half, but you know, this is not a model. I w this is not a moment I was trying to target, and you're getting ballpark. Okay, let me skip this. Okay, so facts about recession: consumers trade down the quality of goods, lower quality goods are less labor intensive. Trading down reduces the demand for labor. That's the accounting part. Models we introduce the quality choice in a bunch of different ways to G models. We look at cyclical shocks, and it looks that it amplifies the volatility. And at least in one of these versions, you can also make a lot of progress on the co-movement. Thanks. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. Question. Yes. Um, so if I had to think, so I wasn't living in the US when this was happening, but if I had to think about years in Spain, probably something similar happened. Okay. But from you know, walking down the street and knowing people, a very big, uh, very big, Influencing, increasing the, the supply of low quality goods would be that there was a huge amount of people in the construction business that almost all lost their job. And these uh, kind of offer this can supply low quality goods in a disproportion, you know, in a more higher percentage than the others. And this led to, you know, mushrooming of, we were talking yesterday, vegetable shops, cheap bars, hairdressers, or, you know. So, I would say, uh, labor supply, you know, and can increase labor supply of low quality goods due to breakdown of uh, construction sector. So, so I, I guess one way to no, no, no. But I think one way to then do it is to say, what if there is a sectoral shock, right? That generates supply. Yes, sectoral supply shock that reallocates labor from that sector to another sector. And those guys can only, if you're a construction, you cannot become a professor. You have to open. That would be interesting, actually. So here, obviously, you're just looking at the ending uh, market shares. In the US, you could see different states yeah. are affected by this, but others weren't. So maybe you can then. The problem is that in CompuStat, you get aggregate data. So you cannot do. It's not indexed by state. No. Yes, please. If you shock, suppose that you shock your economy with the auto door polarization. Yes. Then you should observe that also the demand for the high quality. Yes. Of the sun, and then you don't have the data. Um, so. This is right now applied for 0712. The polarization is a bit more longer trend. Uh, I remember when I was talking at one point to Christy Romer, it was 08. And she was like, I don't know what's happening. We might have to stop buy a car. Okay? And I think that's a moment where you think if the Romers are thinking about that, I mean, it's a pretty big shock, right? What is true is you are extending it. And this long-term shock might play a, a bigger role. Then you should start seeing high market shares. You see, you have to see the bifurcation of the middle, and you do see. In these five years, I think the shock is so big that everyone kind of adjusted. But you are right; your intuition is, is right. But the consumption you should measure is a constant quality total aggregate consumption index, not the quantity. So this is a, there is a hedonic adjustment here, right? You, you, yeah. You yeah. Did that. Yeah, yeah. So you do a hedonic adjustment all the time. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of mechanics, it looks like uh, you add the uh, additional uh, variable to produce the quality, constant quality consumption. Like, uh, in the production, yeah. Q1. You need that so Q, the, right. It's almost like uh, adding the cap capacity, uh, capacity utilization of labor or something. Yeah, like, OK. So the, you, you have a additional yes. variable you can move around on top of the no, that, that, that's, that's a good way to think about it. it. It has this property that as you want more of it, you need to have utilize more labor to get it for, same, for the same uh, output. You're right. No, you're right. In the mechanics, that's, that's similar. So what's the data counterpart of C? That's what I think Novo is asking. Uh, Be careful about that in your formulation. Here? Consumption. So here is, Consumption. Here is going to be. Um, Market shares for CompuStat, yeah. So I have quality tiers, right? And I have total revenues by each quality tier in each sector. And then I can do the shares. That's what I'm doing. So I'm doing dollars, sales, by quality tier, by sector, 
what I, I show, this is the market shares of those three quality tiers. But the, in so terms of the the changes from one to one yeah. period to the next, yeah. consumption measure should not be dollar measured, but, but no, no. be used using base period relative prices. Yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. no, no, because these are the share, again, this is not NIPA consumption, right? Yeah. This is, you have the McDonald's, which I'm going to call. No, no, no. no, no, no. This is a question about when you do your ah. exercises in the model. Oh, in the model. Sorry, sorry, sorry. When you do C, yeah. how are you measuring C? Is it as at base period prices, sum of Q sub I or P sub I, C sub I? Yeah, so the model has, uh, OK, good. Uh, the model has, yeah, yeah, no. the, the, the numerary is investment here. Um, the Q is. The prices, the consumption here is in real prices. It's in real prices. Um, oh, yes. Period, yes. yes. Uh, I believe. That's 3D deflation? Or like that's, those kind of things will matter here. No? Because the composition is what's changing. Yeah. yeah. I think it's in 07, but I have to recheck it, honestly. So it's an 07. So I believe it's. The it, way you're doing it in your well, model is you're taking some or. Uh, I don't know this in, in the model this is actually P times C. In the in the model you, you want to consider it's P times C. It's because it's base, base it's expenses. Base no 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 it's P times C because the numerator is it's P times C. It's the total consumption expenditure in dollar. That's what you is that what the NEPA guys are That's doing? That's the stuff that you gotta be careful Okay, I mean fair enough. I, okay. I agree that whatever I'm doing in the model, I should be doing the data. That, that, that's fair. Or taking away deflation, taking away the, uh, deflation. That, since yeah. this is whatever yeah. they do in the data, yeah. you should yeah, be yeah, doing no, in your model. That's fair. That's fair. They do idonic yeah. adjustments. Yeah. They do idonic adjustments. So that's what they're uh, doing, right? So as long as they're taking away inflation, which I don't have in the model inflation, then the model is doing the hedonic adjustment that presumably the statistical agencies are doing. So the, mo the data comes from with the hedonic adjustment. The model is doing the, the P, the changes in PIC are because of quality. So that, in that sense, it is consistent. No, but you should be using base period prices of 2007 prices times the quantity C no. to calculate no. consumption. No, not, not, not in the, no, but that's for inflation. That's for inflation. No, 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 no. The P, the P, the P in my model is coming, the changes in P are coming from quality, not because of inflation. Yeah, I, I think he's right. I think the statistical agency. Do adjust. Just Hedonic. The, the price index. Uh, for the quality change, right? The, the, maybe, maybe it's not on the same frequency of what I'm doing. That's no, an, but we, I think we're both saying the same thing. The question is, when you do a price index, what, what yeah. you observe is nominal expenditures yeah. on right. a particular type of good. And then yeah, you've got to transfer stuff. Yeah, okay. Okay. okay, sorry. Th th sorry about that. Okay. No yeah, sure. It's whether it's a... Uh, How you